this is just a, a little starter for 10 because it ties in if you've been following my channel for a while you know the deep deep lore of the richard back when me and sam used to make content together instead of just occasionally talking to each other once a week that was probably the golden age or you know maybe the first golden age of richard lewis content we had the doodles made by chloe you know she's now gone on to greater things couldn't be happier for her uh, and we used to do this thing didn't we where we would just talk about whatever was on our mind and it was called the richard lewis show not like now where i just interview people but uh, there was an interview there with the esl a guy called pietro fringuelli who i don't even know if he's still there and it was done by rob crosley if you remember him rob crosley is now a retired esports journalist he doesn't work in esports anymore but we did a whole doodle about it and because you know it was hilarious it was such an aggressive interview and it was so poorly handled by esl it just went down into the annals history we have a doodle about it and everything it's well it's rob crosley so, you know, it just shows how far we've come all of this time forward. Rob Crosley's not in esports. Pietro Franquelli's not in ESL. ESL isn't even ESL anymore. It's just the Saudi Arabian state. So um, it was time for an update. And I saw an interview over on Inven Global. That It's a contender for the new Rob Crosley. And I thought we'd just have a look at it together. I don't know what it is about people in esports, right? If your surname rhymes with shit... You have to be bad at your job, it seems. It's sort of like a a law unto itself. You've got Casper Fit, uh, you know, Casper Shit, as we call him. And now you have Maximilian Schmidt, uh, who is <laughs> Maximilian Shit, unfortunately, as we're about to see. Uh, this interview was conducted by a guy called Tom Mattieson. I sort of know Tom on and off. Um, he's been an esports journalist for a while. Uh, I really like... I, I know I did a tweet the other day because someone, I, th I think it was over at Inven, had kind of like misquoted something I said. And of course, me being me, I'm fucking too hot-headed even in my old age. Like, this is garbage tier journalism. And I completely chewed this person up when I could have just like back-channeled and said to the editors that quote's inaccurate. Uh, you know, I've got to stop doing that. Uh, it's, it's hard to repress my instincts. But in general, I think Inman Global have a good staff. They've got a good editorial team. No harm, no foul on that one. Uh, it's just that the new breed of younger journalists, they see themselves as kind of pseudo-influencers, don't they? So they go for the headlines that are going to generate clout and a headline that says, Richard Lewis claims Cadian and Glaive had punch-up and could be punished by ESL. Didn't say any of those things, of course. But that's going to get you more clicks than Richard Lewis inferred. There was a bit of handbags between Heroic and Astralis, you know? So anyway, this interview was brilliant. It's so archetypal of what riot games are and despite riot games saying you know we're gonna change look at all these new people we're appointing this guy maximilian shit uh does represent everything like I don't, he's relatively new he's relatively new to esports relatively new to riot and yet incredibly culturally they managed to find the exact same type of tight-lipped control focused you know wannabe politician asshole that pretty much just makes up all of riot games management it's kind of uh, incredible now listen i'm not going to get into the fact that it literally looks like someone has drawn a professor's face on an unbelievably thin penis i'm not going to get into that i think that's childish to point that out you can't be you know a credible journalist and mock people for the way they look it just doesn't you know that's just not good you know obviously that can't be allowed to happen so i'm not gonna do that what i am gonna do is go over this interview where any question by the way these questions aren't even like mad difficult he you he just doesn't answer them he just doesn't want to so here we are the LEC is going through a phase of rejuvenation and reinvention. Three years into the franchise, new analysts, interviewers and casters have been introduced to the broadcast, digging into the talent pool of the LPL and the European Regional Finals. Uh, while the increased variety of talent adds interesting new dynamics to the broadcast, it also brings new struggles behind the scenes. Casting is an incredibly competitive field, uh, no matter how well they get along on and off the broadcast, ultimately they're all trying to get in front of the camera. Riot Games, with a monopoly on League of Legends tournaments, is the arbiter of deciding which casters get the opportunities to prove themselves 
playing that role while juggling several interests has proven to be a difficult task. In the offseason, Mark Cadrell Lamont hinted in several tweets he might not be returning to the LEC broadcast. Longtime host, Effia Shocks, uh, sorry about butchering y your name, uh, Deporteret, I've never been able to pronounce his name. I apologize so, so much, I'm terrible with it. Uh, also posted that a nego Shocks <laughs> also posted that a negotiations were unresolved at the start of the year, resulting in a missing the first four weeks of the spring split. Christy Ender Frierson left the LEC in 2021 after he expressed his interest in casting Valorant, but was allegedly told he couldn't combine the two. Now, Riot's rules have changed, and several people, including Ender, have made appearances on the LEC as well as the European Valorant tournaments. Now, just to give you a bit of background on this, for reasons I'll never understand... It, now that Riot Games are expanding their portfolio of games, so they're no longer Riot Game, right? And they've got multiple games. For some reason, it was an internal rule that they didn't want broadcast talent to do Valorant, League, TFT, you know, and have all this overlap. Now, you're going to say, but Richard, that's crazy, right? Because, first of all, the more ubiquitous a person is across all of their broadcasts, the more kind of consistency they have, the more jobs and work they're able to offer them over a season. And I thought you said Riot Games like control. So this goes against all of the narratives you've ever spat out publicly, Richard. You're a liar. Well, actually, no. Let me explain to you why they do it this way. Because... If you have one member of talent or two members of talent or three members of talent and they're doing all of your games and everyone loves them and they're super good at it, guess what? That Those talent have you over a fucking barrel, don't they? Because you don't just lose them for one game, you lose them for all your shit. And then you get not one complaint from one community. Why aren't they there? Right? And remember, Riot is a company for all of their, like, bold proclamations about, we are the leaders of the esports space, and we... You know, you're beholden to Reddit, you fucking pussies. So, as a result of that, they would rather have one complaint once about one person than three big scenes complaining about one person, you see. So that's why they do it. They've also done a number of other ridiculous rules. You've heard Dust. You've seen Dust on the Disc Golf Tour, right? You know him? Well, you probably don't remember. But before he became the voice of Disc Golf, he used to do esports and he used to do CS and he did Valorant. And for reasons that I couldn't understand... They did this thing where they were breaking up the uh, the duos. So if you were a duo from Europe and you part uh, and, and America divided, you weren't allowed to cast together. <laughs> they just broke that up. Crazy. Yeah, you know, why they would want to do that? So they were saying to him, "You and Vince can't be a duo anymore." Because and, and listen again. The reason for that, guys, first of all, yes, it is control because they want to see who will bend to their will. But second of all, it's because, as we've seen with their recent announcement, yeah, guess what? We want to break off into little regions, don't we? And you can't have a beloved duo and suddenly now one person needs to relocate to cover that league. More costs, more money, more influence. They don't want, they don't want their talent having that. So... Anyway, there you go. That's just to give you all the background on the decision. So, naturally, it'd be good to get a guy who... There he is, right? Right, it's Maximilian Schmidt. This is the guy who's making these decisions, right? It'd be good to get him in front of a microphone and ask him questions and get some answers. That's what you would think. So, also, because I, Tom's been very thorough, and I love the way this has all been framed... Uh, the environment Riot Games harbored for LEC talent also came under severe scrutiny this year. In January, former LEC analyst and color caster Indiana Frosker and Black accused the LEC of nepotism, bullying, sexism, and leaving her unpaid for six months. Riot Games did not publicly comment on these allegations, despite having said to be committed to improving the workplace environment after the company was exposed for creating a workplace environment rampant with problems. That, by the way, I, I saw a lot of people, and it's like it's like you guys don't, there's some people still in this audience, which I'm always curating, right? I'm kind of like a Stuart Lee figure, right? You have to be on top of your game, right, with me. And some of you, some of you don't know who I am still, right? So first of all, when when she did that rant on G4 TV, you remember the Chuddersphere all made videos about it, didn't they? Shocked emoji uh, with pictures of like the metrics of G4 TV, you know, going down. By the way, it was doomed to fail from the start. 
you know, but whatever. That's got nothing to do with Froskering. And then they were like, yeah, look, you know, go woke, go broke, go woke, go broke. Even though by almost every, almost every conceivable metric, being woke is sort of a viable corporate strategy and does work. They said it, for example, after Kaepernick when the share price went down and then the next quarter Nike were announcing record sales, you know, go woke, go broke. No, 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 it's not a universal rule, guys. It doesn't matter how much, I know it rhymes, <laughs> and we all like a good rhyme like hey hey ho ho whatever it is that you don't like has got to go we all love rhymes right we all love rhymes but the bottom line is just because something rhymes does not make it true i want to make that abundantly clear to everyone out there listening that just because it rhymes it doesn't make it true so g4 when she did the g4 tv rant spoiler I don't really think she said anything that bad. I don't really necessarily sort of disagree with, I think probably 90, it might even be 99% guys. I don't know. Like I, so I was just like, yeah, she's just expressed an opinion. She's perfectly entitled to express an opinion. She's earned the right to an opinion. She's taken her licks in the industry and that's just how it works. Right. So I didn't make a video about it. People were going, bloody hell, you should get in on this frosker and stuff. You should make a video about it. Do all this traffic. No, nah, I'm actually very much on her side. Here's the other thing. Here's the other aspect respect to it she was a very good friend to maria and a, and a good friend to me and i'm loyal to death <laughs> so i don't give i don't put my loyalty into things and then pull it out right just to get some fucking twitter clout so sometimes i'll i'll knowingly go and stand on a side where i'm gonna get pelted with rocks because i'm standing with my family i'm standing with people i care about <laughs> so that's that's who i am at my core fundamentally loyal to a fault perhaps but loyal all the same loyalty is one of the most valuable qualities because it is in such fucking rare supply so that's that so no i'm not making a video <laughs> castigating her for what she said and i'll also say the bigger part of what what people should have focused on which really shows by the way how little nuance goes into these topics do you ever wonder why Frostgren might feel a bit jaded, a bit upset, might feel like she doesn't have a lot of friends in the industry, might feel that her audience is actively willing her to fail? Could it be that at every turn in her career, she's been treated like absolute shit? And she publicly said, by the way, that this was a very dark time in her life while she was bu being bullied by Riot Games and, and Riot Games management. They were even withholding her money. She didn't know what she was going to do, but she couldn't in good conscience ever go back to it. And that's how she ended up at G4. Do you think that might have an impact on the way someone views the world and no where were the where were the chudosphere videos riot games abusing another woman employee where were they oh nowhere nowhere because that wasn't the one that was going to get you the clout and the youtube hits in the chudosphere so i'm glad tom's included that because that was a fucking important point she brought up and i see someone say she takes every opportunity to dump on thor yes i know i'd love them to get along right but they don't but listen, even with my homeboy Duncan, who again, yes, I will. I, I have took the stand for him many times. Go look at my history. You won't find many, many members of talent that go against. Like this is back when I used to work events, and I said if ESL don't want to hire Duncan and deem him unsuitable for a broadcast, they don't get to work with me. And that was where the word the package came from. But at the end of the day. That isn't gonna, you know, I, I, I would love to be a peacekeeper and reconcile, but they're both their own people and not everyone has to get along with everybody else. And we're all adults and we can all respect that. That's just how it is. And also, by the way, spoiler, because Thorin isn't some sort of blinkered monster like people make him out to be, he did make the same point I've just made about the mistreatment she received and even highlighted it and said this is a disgrace. And he also urged his followers not to harass her or to say anything negative to her because he, he understands how that can contribute to a negative headspace. No, you know, wasn't a lot of that being brought up during I Am Esports Gate, was there? Reality is a never neat, right? Anyway, so I love Tom for including that because that got glossed over, right? Games have still never, never commented on the allegations. By the way, silence almost certainly means, yeah, we, we, di we did it. Because <laughs> if you've got the evidence to just slam dunk somebody who's, who's essentially accusing you of what could even be potential crimes, you, you put the evidence out in the public domain. So he, he has a little starter here, right? He goes, oh, we've got lots of uh, new talent coming up in the LEC. How do you feel about it? It's awesome. Okay, good, good. I love it. You lure him in. 
Lure him in with an easy question. Like, ha <laughs> you having a cup of tea? Mm, it's a lovely moment. Biscuit, yeah. Mm. Get him in. And then, right? They seem to grind a lot as new casters, uh, to be honest. Because uh, Dagda also does the LPL. Nimera, as you said, also does ERL casting. It sometimes feels like they're on a broadcast for six days a week. How do you feel about that? So immediately, right? There's this inference, isn't there? Yeah, six days uh, working weeks, a bit much, isn't it? And then, get used to this phrase. Because even though Professor Penishead is in charge, he doesn't know anything. It's, it's, it's crazy how little he knows uh, relative to his seniority in the, in the company. Yeah, I honestly don't know what their schedules look like exactly. I, I could bring you up the VODs if you want. <laughs> I would want to make sure, obviously, that they're comfortable with the work they're putting in. If that were to become a habit, that would definitely potentially be a concern on my end. We don't want people working six days a week. That's not super healthy. That's something I didn't know and I will look into. Okay, all right, all right. He's got over the first hurdle. Casting is a very competitive field. Obviously, they'll be professional on broadcast, but they're all trying to get that spot on the show. We recently saw in Valorant, the Riot Games suddenly got rid of Sean Gares and DDK, despite being beloved. I realize that the LEC is more established already, but how do you handle competition between casters? Honestly, I'm not the best person to talk about that topic specifically. Our broadcast lead would be way better equipped to say how they think about the different casters throughout the year. Sadly, they're not here, of course, because you're interviewing me. I know that when it comes to structuring our arrangements with the casters, we obviously set expectations with them as well. We want to make sure that everybody knows going into the season that they have an understanding of how much of a level of involvement involvement they would have with the broadcast itself. Then we leave us that, some wiggle room in the end to make sure we can tweak where necessary and we can potentially bring in new guests or give additional opportunities to some of the existing casters. That doesn't really answer the question, does it? He's kind of... With that one. All right, fair enough, okay. Ender is now back on the broadcast. He's doing a very good job. But last year, he felt pressured to leave because he wanted to cast European Valorant as well as LEC. Now, apparently, those rules have changed. Can you elaborate on why those rules were there to begin with and what has changed since? I do not really have the expertise to talk on that specific, uh, specifically because it's a very Valorant-specific topic and I'm not the expert on Valorant, right? Okay. No, but uh, I think it was the LEC, <laughs> the thing you run, uh, who said that he could not do Valorant and the LEC together. That may have been the stance that happened, and that existed back in the day. Spoiler, a few months. If I had to assume, I would guess that it's likely because Valorant wanted to ensure that they have the opportunity to create their own brand, create their own product, and not feel like their little brother of LEC. I think if there was a straight up copy paste entirety of the talent, I'd understand how people could come to that conclusion. I'd also understand that they wanted to prevent that. But as I said, I'm not the best person to talk on the Valorant side. Writer's note, there's a couple of these notes. Maximilian Shit told Invan Global directly after this interview was conducted that Riot would look into providing more context surrounding the cast rules for LEC and the Valorant EMEA. As of publishing this article, Riot Games has not responded to multiple requests for said context. Multiple requests. Riot Games is telling you, yeah, just go fuck yourself. I don't want to talk too much about the Valorant side, says Tom, but... I do want to talk a bit more about the competitiveness and hiring casters. We saw in the off season that it appeared Cadrill would be returning, even though he uh, wouldn't be returning, even though he was very beloved. Shock's negotiations also took very long. The LEC has existed for so long, so why do these things still happen? Now, at least he claims to know <laughs> and understand this part, but what he says is absolute bullshit. I think it's super normal, honestly 
that negotiations happen between both parties. There are legitimate interests on both sides when it comes to expectations, when it comes to looking at the entirety of the year. It's just a process of alignment to make sure everyone understands the opposing side, where they're coming from, and what they're trying to achieve, and what they want to get out of the relationship in the end. I'm super happy we were able to come to that mutual ground and mutual understanding with both Cadrill and Shocks and all the other talent that we have at the moment. So, <laughs> let me just elaborate on this. You see, up until Riot Games, I'd never heard of a games development company operating in the esports space trying to tell people that work on that product what games they can play on stream, whether they can stream at all. In fact, I'm trying to think, the only company I ever heard that had, well, there was two. The only an, sort of anachronistic companies with their stances towards social media and like live streaming and stuff was the NFL. Well, not the NFL, the, the, the NCAA, I should say, particularly with football, because there's a number of collegiate footballers that wanted to have YouTube channels, but because YouTube channels were monetized, were told they had to choose, pick the YouTube channel or the scholarship, because the NCAA is garbage. And uh, the WWE. The WWE tell their talent, because they're like image rights their, their 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 character if you like is tied up with the industry they can't you know he, you can't sit down and throw on a live stream without vince mcmahon's permission so you end up you know essentially being completely controlled in how much reach you're allowed to have what your social media output is and by the way in the wwe if you speak up about this and say we should get a union together to push back on some of this stuff they just terminate your contract because the wwe is a fucking garbage company run by roid heads <laughs> and nutcases that can't see the new visionary future also love a bit of business with saudi over in that neck of the woods so that is who Riot Games are in line with, because in esports, I've never heard of a company telling their broadcast talent, you can't have your own like Twitch stream and stream the games or like do watch parties in your own time. I've never seen a company tell players you cannot stream Hearthstone because we think it's going to be popular and it's going to help one of our business competitors. I've never heard of an esports or organization telling a multi-gaming organization if you want to have a team for our competitive esport you cannot have a, a team in a rival game. Never heard of that. Only Riot Games ever did these things. So no, it's not super healthy. In fact, let me tell you about the negotiations I've had with esports companies down the years. So, ESL would get a call. Hey, Rich, do you want to do this event? Yeah. What's your day rate? It's this. Yeah, we can do that. No problem. See you at the event. Handshake. Not even a contract. Right? <laughs> Which, in retrospect, is done by me. But that was just how we did things. By like 2015, it got a bit more official. You would get an email. So when I was doing the dream hacks, we all know that story ended. But when I was doing the dream hacks or the face it, you would get an email. Hey, Richard, you available to do this event? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd love to. Is your day rate the same? Yeah, fuck it. I don't want to put it up. It's not about the money for me. Just want to do the event. Awesome. Can you do our entire tour this year? These are the calendar dates. Yeah, fuck it. I'm all in. See you at all of them. Brilliant. Here's an email confirming it. Just send a reply with a thumbs up. Yep, no worries. That was how we used to do it. When 2015 came along, and at the end of 2015, start of 2016, an E-League hit me up. I had an agent by then. E-League said, do you want to be on American television? Being a host for a Counter-Strike themed esports show. I said, yeah. My agent said, no bother, we'll get, I'll, I'll negotiate your salary. They came back, said, we can't break the bank because it's going to be a startup, essentially, that's going to operate periphery, you know, to turn a sports. Here's, we can pay you, I think first year I got like 120,000. Might have been a little bit higher because there was like some performance bonuses and stuff in there. And I said, you know what? 
I'm a fucking esports journalist at the Daily Dot making nowhere near that. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, if I'd actually know, I'd left the Daily Dot and I was at the Dread Breitbart there. So, uh, right, okay. No problem. So I said, thank you. No worries. And the only agreement we had at E-League was if I wanted to work another event during E-League, it couldn't overlap with E-League, and I had to ask permission. And I said, you're paying me a lot of money, you're treating me great, you're giving me creative input into the pro project, why would I devalue what we're building by being on an ESL event? So I worked the E-League majors as a shoe in but I turned down all the other events at that time because there was some value in E-League being the place where you see Lil Momo and Thorin and Richard having banter back and forth and Mo making coos to cry and stuff like that. You don't want to dilute that. So I took that decision. Now, crucially, I wouldn't have took that decision if you were underpaying me, if you weren't allowing me freedom to... Because they, they, they let me keep my YouTube channel, They right? They let me keep doing the podcasts. If they took that away from me... I would have said, this isn't going to work. Guess what Riot do? And then they wonder why they're getting hardballed and negotiated. They say, you can't stream, you can't do watch-alongs, you can't create YouTube content, you can't work rival events, you can't work other games. P.S. Here's some money that's actually below industry standard, and you must agree to all of that on top. And then they go, I think it's perfectly healthy people negotiate. Negotiations are easy and quick if both parties are aligned and not trying to fuck each other. That's reality. So Riot, this guy's full of shit. It doesn't even look healthy from the outside that the face of your product, like you have one of the best hosts to ever have worked in esports in the form of shocks. And she might walk away from your broadcast for unspecified reasons. I'm sorry if you think that looks healthy. But from the outside looking in, it looks like you're giving her a reason to not be there. Anyway, I heard Riot told Cadrill, this is when he first objected, well, thanks for what you've done. And then that was kind of it. And he said, that's definitely not the case. Now, spoiler. <laughs> Uh, that might be the case, uh, because obviously, look, I, I don't make League of Legends content anymore, but I still talk to League of Legends people, and I'm still, you know, you know, as, as I proved re with the TSM story recently, I heard that pretty much they just said, like, listen, th this isn't a negotiation. <laughs> They went to the negotiation, which makes total sense if you know who Riot are. They sort of just said, listen, this isn't a negotiation. It's a place where we tell you what we want, and you either agree with it or you don't. It's a negotiation in the loosest sense. So Cadrill just said, well, listen, this is what I want to do, then fine. And that, and that was it. It wasn't like, oh, no, okay, look, I could change, please stay. But apparently, definitely not the case. While laughing, no less. Laughter. <laughs> so funny how we treat our talent. Another topic that I mailed the LEC about three times back then, but unfortunately didn't get a reply. Unfortunately didn't get a reply. In January, one of your former casters, Froskren, made a comment on Reddit and said there was a period where she wasn't paid for six months by the LEC. What are your thoughts on that? Has it happened with other casters? Not that I'm aware of. Again, I'm not the broadcast on air specialist. No, no, but you're the head of the European League. It falls under your domain. Certainly, certainly. I'm happy to follow up on that and check in with the head of broadcast to make sure we understand where the potential issue was and to make sure that we obviously fixed that if it, if it has been the case. As I said, though, <laughs> this is where... See, this is where we're getting into the world. It's Tom Matthiasson. Summer Tyson Nine. Right. As I said, though, I've mailed about it three times, and I'm sure that, given the buzz it caused on social media, someone at Riot will have noticed. Someone must have checked what happened there, right? Potentially. I'll look into that. I'm happy to let Jean, PR for Riot EMEA, know to follow up with you as soon as I know more. I'm not aware of that specific incident, and I'm not aware of six months of no payment. That being said, 
If that is an ongoing issue and it's still not fixed, that's something that should be remedied. Another thing she said, meaning Froskeren, was that there was a lot of nepotism in the hiring process, that there was a lot of workplace toxicity. She also said that she was subject to sexist remarks. Those are heavy allegations. Are you aware of those? Because if those allegations happen, I assume it's something you want to be aware of. Absolutely. And I appreciate you pushing that forward. From my perspective, I'm not aware <laughs> of any ongoing issues in that regard. On the contrary, I think we're trying to be 100% fair when it comes to our decisions, when it comes to hiring, when it comes to contract negotiations, etc. I'd be surprised if that was the case. Well, you say ongoing issues, but obviously she's left and no longer works at the LEC. So was that an issue at the time? I don't know. <laughs> Hello, mother. It's me, Mr. Birds. What's your first name? I don't know. I can't believe this guy. I can't believe this guy. And then, check it out. You do not know. All right. So, if someone made an allegation of, hey, there's sexism, that didn't reach you? Because she said she called it out internally. It really depends on timing, right? Just for full transparency, I got into this role last year. And that was also during the process of Frost leaving. That may have just been something that has been handled by my predecessor. But again, as I said, I'm happy to follow up on that to understand the potential issue. Writer's note. Despite Infant Global reaching out multiple times, Riot Games did not provide the promised follow-up answers regarding Froskeren's allegations as of publishing this article. You don't need to hear the last question. To be fair to Tom, he ends on a sweet note, much like the first one. By the way, the shit sandwich approach in interviews does work. Actually unfucking real it's crazy to me that, like, basically, corporate America are just like this. It's like, just uh, deny everything, uh, blame it on your predecessor, um, it'll be fine. It's your responsibility now, but, you know. Just keep deflecting, keep deflecting, keep deflecting, and I'll circle back. I'll circle back on that one. I'll circle back on that one and get out the room and then never circle back. The tested, tried and true DNC shuffle. Mental. So there you go. I think that, by the way, that is one of the most brutal interviews I have seen in a long, long time. I think that's up there with Rob Crosley. So maybe, maybe there's another doodle in the future. I don't know how funny this one will be. I'll have to do more. Tom and Tyson! I have him in a loincloth. We'll, we'll edit Sam in. CGI Sam.